like a little bit of theory, right? So you guys uh, know what's happening under the hood, right? Uh, I, I think like honestly, I think that's the most part, the, the most important part, you know, <laughs> because as you can see, the codes, they're very simple, right? Like most of it is it's already implemented, like in very clean and uh, user-friendly libraries that you pretty much just need to provide the inputs and outputs, right? So I think that like understanding how things work so you can uh, make appropriate use of the parameters that those libraries they offer, right? And like when things don't work, you know exactly how to intervene and perhaps uh, fix stuff, you know? So I think that's the really the, the goal of these uh, few lectures that I'm gonna be with you guys. I like the gentle introduction, very good. Relate to the formula. Yeah, perfect, yeah. So uh, I'm exactly gonna cover that uh, as like a quick review of what we discussed in the previous lecture. And I realized, because other people asked as well, uh, that uh, the transition from the support vector machine, right? Uh, which it's mostly used for classification problems, how we can adapt that to uh, regression and how the parameters, they uh, might help you to perform a regression. Uh, it's not entirely clear. So I'm gonna start the class today exactly by explaining in a bit more details how this tran transition takes place. So yes, I'll do that now. Okay, yeah, so just for the sake of time, let's get started, right? So I say that this is the lecture about perceptions, uh, which uh, ideally I would have this whole lecture just about perception, but I realize that people usually, they uh, understand better the concept of perception when you make uh, links with things that people are more familiar with. So uh, I changed the roadmap a little bit. So uh, the previous lecture, we had support a vector machine, right? So I, we very briefly explained like how support a vector machine tries to find these optimal hyperplanes that I explained to you. And these hyperplanes, they're conditional, these variables like the uh, regularization of the ways that you use, this epsilon that someone just asked me about, right? Uh, and what we're gonna see is that like, there are other methods that they're uh, also very famous and they simply stand for not having a constraint on how optimal this hyperplane is. And like some of these methods are known for like logistic regression, ridge regression, you know, like, so we are gonna see exactly like how removing components from one method and other in adding few other punctual elements to this, uh, uh, minimization problems that we're trying to solve. You move from uh, one classic regression or classification uh, technique to another. So that, that's usually like a pretty cool way of learning like how, what's the difference between these methods, right? And then before I start with perception, right? Uh, I'm gonna just review very briefly linear regression with you guys. I'm pretty sure you all are very familiar with that. I just want to make sure we are all on the same page. Uh, then I'm going to define what's the minimizing, uh, the minimization problem that we're trying to solve with respect to like these loss functions, right? Which I very briefly started discussing on the support of vector machine lecture, but uh, apparently not everyone is comfortable with some of these concepts. So I decided to uh, cover that in a bit more details. Uh, we're going to talk about regularization, which apparently is one of the questions that were remaining from the previous lecture, according to one of the comments that we saw now. And then finally, I'm going to start with the perception. And hopefully we have time to, <laughs> to, to do the whole perception of this class, but we have plenty of time, right? So like uh, I prefer to not rush and make sure that everyone is understanding those concepts properly, OK? Any questions so far? Everyone agree with the plan for the lecture? Good, yeah, so. Good, perfect, Antonio. All right, yeah. Glad that at least Pepe talks to me. <laughs> okay, uh, good. Uh, so let me just move this thing a little bit. Okay, you guys can see the slides properly, right? Okay, great. Yes, so, yes. So we are gonna start with this uh, very quick recap of what we saw in support of vector machine. 
because I know that not everyone was here. Apparently, Sebastian was not here, but I'm glad that he's here today with us. Uh, so uh, what we described uh, in the previous lecture basically is that the support directed machine is trying to find a hyperplan, right? And by hyperplan, it's uh, it's not trivial to see a hyperplan on this uh, classification problem here because it's a 2D, right? And a hyperplan, by definition, it has one less dimension than the problem that you're working with, right? So if the problem that I'm working with is 2D, what's the dimensionality of the hyperplan? Anyone? A linear, a linear equation. <clears throat> yeah, it's 1D, right? Which a, it's a single line, right? So you see that the hyperplan for this problem that we're working with, it's 1D, so it's a line. But if it was a three-dimensional problem, then the hyperplan, it's an actual plan, it's 2D, and so on, right? Great. So as we discussed, there are several ways to solve this problem, right? Because like, if my only goal is to just separate those two classes, I have infinite hyperplans that are capable of doing that, right? And there are several methods that uh, aim in fighting that, okay? And we are gonna see some of them uh, in a few slides, right? But the uh, cool thing about the support directed machine is that you try to find the optimal hyperplan by doing what exactly? Anyone that was in the last lecture can help me to explain what exactly the support director machine does to find the optimal hyperplane. No? Anything related to the margin that we see here? Is it projecting the points into the decision boundary? Right, yeah. It's related to projecting the points to the decision boundary. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yeah, Sorry. I can hear you. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, it was also to optimize, uh, to maximize the distance from the plane to the clouds of points, the clusters, I mean. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and that, that's exactly why this uh, hyperplane is optimal, right? Because that's the hyperplane that uh, places the points the furthest away from the decision boundary, right? And by doing so, we minimize the likelihood, right, that we have a misclassification of a point. Of course, this is the, uh, the convergence of this method doesn't ensure that you're gonna have every single point properly classified, right? Because I, my data can be noisy. So I could have like a blue square on the other side of the decision boundary, right? Like someone messed up with that uh, measurement, right? Or the uh, uh, remote sensing equipment that you're using had a cloud in front of it. I don't know if that's an actual issue or not, but could happen, right? So like we, we, that, those are two things that could perhaps corrupt that measurement, right? So there was this intuition that I tried to tell you guys, uh, which is like that these weights that we're learning, basically they are telling us uh, what's the distance between the actual points, right? So like here, I'm just illustrating two points, an X1 and an X2, right? And here is like a trial or like a proposed decision boundary, right? And this Y, uh, this W here, essentially it stands for like, what's the distance that I, I am uh, from, that that point is from the decision boundary, okay? And I just said to you that like, okay, this is essentially uh, uh, an intuition that comes from linear algebra, right? But I, uh, I, I just threw this piece of information out there. Nobody asked me if what, what I was actually saying. So I put this figure here just to make sure that this concept is like concrete in our minds, okay? So you see that these uh, weights, they are uh, orthogonal to the decision boundary, right? And the uh, largest the weight that I have, the furthest away I would be from that point, okay? But of course, I cannot be infinitely away from that point because necessarily I would be moving closer to the points in the other class, okay? So like you see that I, I have to play this uh, game between like where I'm gonna be placing this boundary but still like trying to maximize the distance between the two classes, right? So one alternative 
is that instead of trying to uh, maximize the distance between those two, right? I can try to make each one of these points to attract the boundary, right? And the convergence in this case is that like by attracting this guy, right, towards here, I would be maximizing this distance. And by attracting this decision boundary towards these guys, I would be maximizing this distance, which also solves the problem and allows me to write a very uh, beautiful equation that I can just minimize very easily, okay? Which is this equation that I showed to you guys here. Good? And then I try to explain to you very briefly uh, how this uh, game goes in order to optimize those weights, right? That are the distance that I, each one of my points are from the decision boundary by doing that like uh, for each one of the points in the class, right? And okay, any questions until here? Is the idea of support a vector machine kind of clear for everyone? what it does in terms of classification and placing this decision boundary. So the weight is nothing else than the distance between the, the line at each single point. So that mm -hmm. one is the one that we are trying to minimize. Correct. It is similar to the concept of linear regression when we try to minimize the error. Exactly, yeah. And that's one of the things that I would like you guys to realize that in the end of the day, what you're doing is basically performing a linear regression, right? Which we are contrasting to uh, something which is essentially telling us how bad we're doing in that task, right? But in the end of the day, what you're doing is to perform a linear transformation on points, right? By just multiplying them by like a learned set of weights. So it is by all means a linear regression and Pep is fully right. Okay, very good. So the part that I didn't uh, uh, explain in much details in the previous lecture, right, is how we go from that to regression. What I told you is that I can simply flip the game. So instead of trying to place uh, this decision boundary as far away from the points as I can, right, because that would ensure me that I have the optimal hyperplan that divides those, those two sets of points, like the red square, uh, the red circles and the blue squares. I can flip the game and say that now I want to, to find a hyperplan that's pass as close as possible to all the points that I have, which by definition is a regression, right? Is that clear for everyone? <clears throat> okay, so now <clears throat> the margin, right? Like the, the, the margin that I have essentially explains to me how far away my uh, hyper plan, right? Which here is now represented by this red line, okay? So the data points, they are shown in blue, okay? So this is a CO2D problem because it's just easier for us to visualize. But note that uh, I have no constraints on the dimensionality of the problem, right? So like I could be doing that in like, arbitrarily large dimensions, okay? So now we have two parameters, right? So I had the parameter that's telling me what is this margin? Like where the points they lie within these boundaries that are being set by the uh, hyperparameter, right? And I have this one that says like, okay, even though this is the margin, I still have this much of error. That's this C that I have, okay? So now my loss change to be, I still trying to minimize the weights because the weights, they basically are this constraint with respect to where the margins are, right? And I have now one more parameter, which is the tolerance that I'm allowed to have with respect to the error, right? Because again, if I'm trying to place the optimal hyper plan to perform this regression, right? Uh, the hyper plan is defined by this epsilon, which says like how much of uh, optimal fitting I, I have with respect to the points, right? And I have a tolerance that also tells me like how much I'm willing to accept with respect to misclassification or like poor fitting to the data that I have, okay? So now I have just those two parameters that I need to optimize, which is this C, which now is defined by each one of these points, 
right? Like how far away they are from the margins that I'm setting, right? And also this uh, set of weights that are basically they are trying to tell me like how wide is uh, the uh, neighborhood or the margins of my uh, hyperplan, okay? So you see that's like the equation per se is very similar, right? Look, this was the loss function for the supporter vector machine classification, okay? And this is the one that we have for regression. Extremely similar, right? Any questions until here? So did, did this explain a little better what is this epsilon and uh, what is the re regularization that you're looking for? Are there any questions? Like whoever asked that question on the uh, poll, if you still have any questions about that, please feel free to speak. And I'm going to try to address that. So can we say that this uh, basically covers like SVM for both classification and regression now? Are we all good with those concepts? Because as Pepe hinted here, right? Essentially what we're doing is this to solve a linear regression, right? So this is a linear regression, correct? We're just trying to find the optimal set of weights that are gonna transform my data point. And I'm gonna compare to something to say if my classification was good or bad in this case. In here, I also do the same. Basically, I'm trying to find this uh, uh, set of weights here, right? That are gonna minimize my loss. So like that is gonna grant me the best fit uh, to this data that I have, right? So if you go to that code that I shared with you guys on Jupyter Notebook, right? You're gonna see that some of the parameters that we have there for the SVR uh, library, that's the one that I use for the regression using support of a vector machine. We had the epsilon, right? So epsilon, again, is defining how wide is this margin that I, uh, I want to have. So it, it, let, let's play a little game here. So if I say that this epsilon that I'm, I want to have, it's smaller than the default, what's the implication of that? Can anyone tell me? just to make sure that we, we really got this concept. It may happen that um, your regression is not considering all the points, but just some of them. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's still gonna consider all the points, right? I'm just saying that like now this mar margin, it's a little tighter, right? So if the margin is tighter, I increase the likelihood that I'm gonna have a, a poor fit, which perhaps it's what you're saying that I'm not gonna be considering all the points, right? Maybe that's what you, you wanted to, to say. Not exactly, but that's okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, but it's, it's that idea that like, perhaps I'm gonna have a poor fit for some of the points because if the margin is lower, right? Like some of these points, they are gonna be now outside of the margin, right? So like, I'm gonna have a poor fit for those points, right? And the tolerance basically says like, okay, you should stop this method of like trying to find the optimal hyper plan when you have an error that's below this tolerance. So like, until you find this tolerance, you keep like shifting around this uh, hyperplane and trying to find the best fit, okay? So if you have a tolerance that's really small, right? So you say that you don't want to have this difference between the uh, uh, upper bound margin and the actual point to be this big, but it should be a little lower. Uh, you, the method might just not converge at all, right? Because you never reach the tolerance. So that's also a risk that you're taking by making the tolerance too tight. So you say like, I want a really good fit. So like I want this epsilon to be small and I also want this uh, tolerance to be small because I want a, a R square of like 0 0.99999. Like probably you're just not gonna converge to anything, right? So you, you have to be a bit more flexible with those methods, okay? Then we listed a bunch of like uh, limitations of these methods, right? Some of them uh, is exactly that these models, they usually, uh, the support vector machine-based models, I mean, 
uh, they have this quadratic complex with respect to the number of samples. So I don't know if any of you guys try to play with the code. Uh, the data set, the tree height, I think has over a million samples, right? And for the uh, experiment that I did with you guys in the Jupyter Notebook, uh, I only use like 20,000 samples, right? And if you try to run yourself, you realize that even to fit those 20,000 samples, it was quite slow already, right? And we don't even have like that many dimensions in the data set. Uh, the whole data set had 23 uh, features in which one of them is this estimate of the tree height. So essentially you only have 22 features, right? It's a pretty small data set. Uh, with respect to like number of features and like number of samples. And it's still support a vector machine has a hard time to do a fit there. And with the default parameters, we didn't get like a great score, right? Uh, I don't know if any of you guys try to optimize that. And if you found like a better performance, anyone that did some of the experiments with that uh, supporter uh, vector regression would like to share some of their observations. But let me change the question. Who actually played with the code after the, the class? Maybe Jiska bit. She was the only one making a one question for the code. <laughs> no, I, 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 I run the code, but I didn't have time to start okay. playing with the parameters. So. Okay, fair enough, yeah. I mean, okay, this maybe is, next time we will try to do it together. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a it's a proposed exercise, right? Like as, as I said, like support a vector machine is not even my goal for like in most cases, but it's it's nice to see exactly uh, what are the parameters, right, and how they might play a role. Now knowing what they are they are meant for, right? So like you have a better intuition of how those parameters they work, right? But in any case, if you have a larger data set, there are things that you might be more successful uh, in employing for your uh, problem, right? Some of them is this the stochastic gradient descent regressor. Being a stochastic gradient, also the backbone of like uh, neuronal networks. So we're gonna see a lot about stochastic gradient in like a few uh, slides, perhaps next lecture, let's see how we are doing with time. And also like, using different types of kernels, right? So for example, one of the other things that I said that uh, you, you can also change is the type of kernel that you use for the support of vector machine. So like by default, the things that we're seeing here, it's a linear kernel, right? But you might as well have more complex kernels. So like some of them is like this radio uh, base field, RBF, right? And they have like more complex shapes in order to fit stuff, okay? So uh, they can add a degree of flexibility. Let's say that, for example, your data set, uh, it's more complex and has like curved shapes. So like it would be very difficult for you to fit a perfect hyperplane in a data set that looks like this and another one that looks like that, right? So it's very hard to fit a line in this space, right? But if you allow your uh, hyperplane to be curved as well, right? You might have a better fit. So you see that the shape of this kernel, the the kernel that or the shape of the kernel basically tells you what's the shape of your hyperplane. So if you change the shape of the kernel, you might have a hyperplane that's a better fit for your data. So it's always good to visualize your data before you try to uh, use anything to solve it. Okay. Good. Any questions here? Hey, Antonio, I have a question on the last bullet. Um, yeah. It says that basically when target classes are, are overlapping, is that like when you're thinking from kind of a spectral analysis perspective um, and you're trying to, you know, use this to do some, for example, land use land cover classification, wouldn't you have like a lot of kind of overlapping target classes with kind of like mixed spectra when you're thinking about like a river that's right next to you know, the, the grasses, for example, that you're trying to extract? That could be a case, definitely. Uh, when I wrote that, I was thinking of something simpler, to be honest. So for example, uh, one of the examples that happens quite often is uh, poorly done uh, reading of like a measurement, right? And I told you like, one potential case. Uh, you just described one that's very valid, true. But the one that I was hitting, uh, hinting towards 
it's basically like imagine that something could perhaps corrupt the estimate of the tree height somehow, right? And we know that there are some things that they are they are going to degrade the capacity of this uh, reading to be good, right? And I think you guys covered some of those with Pepe, right? One of the flags that you have for the reading is uh, if that reading was good or bad, given some conditions of the measurements, right, Pepe? Yes, perfect. So this one, in that case, by uh, by analyzing the, by checking the different quality flag, you can you can have a better uh, selecting the, the 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 points that are better estimating the height. Right. Uh, so in that case, there could be that you are able to you know to distinguish to be better represent you are not in the mixing of all the points and so um so you are trying to re reduce the error of the response variable mm -hmm. right yeah but in that case let's say that's like you don't have necessarily this flag that tells you how good the measurement was so all that comes to you is that like uh, you got a measurement that uh was supposed to be a tree that's like 20 meters given like 20 meters high given the location but you got something that looks like 100 right so like it's a uh, it's saying that like oh i have a, a sequoia apparently <laughs> by right by the 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 side of the river which doesn't make much sense perhaps right so like that's a noise a noisy measurement there and uh supporter vector machine usually has a hard uh, hard time trying to fit into data that looks like that. But like right. most methods are gonna have issues with that. So like that's not very specific to support a vector machine. Good? Right, uh, no, yeah, that's good. That was gonna be my follow-up is it, it seems like that might be a consistent issue uh, regardless of whether mm -hmm. you're using it or something else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. How are we doing? Oh, w when is the break? Yeah, more or less, we can decide to have only one break, so two breaks, like you, like okay. two breaks of 10 or one of 20, 25, yeah, as you prefer. Uh, okay, let me go a little further, and then I stop in a bit, okay? So one thing that I said also in the beginning of the class, right, is that there are uh, other methods that not necessarily try to impose how optimal those hyperplans are, right? And one of them is the logistic regression, right? So like in the logistic regression, uh, I, I think Longzhu covered logistic regression, right? Yes, he covered it up. Yeah. Okay, yeah, excellent. Yeah, because I just want to make like a, a little parallel to like what logistic regression do in this case. So logistic regression is try to maximize the probability that you're gonna have a, a good classification for that point. Right. So like you see that in, in support director machine, we are comparing the performance right of our classifier because like W here, it's essentially our classifier. W is saying how much we should transform these positions, right? Uh, in order to uh, place the hyperplane in a, uh, in a position in this space that better divides the two classes, right? So here I have a directly comparison to like what I'm actually trying to fit with respect to the data, right? So I do a, a comparison of like, okay, given this uh, uh, new hyperplane, if I perform a classification right now, I have this amount of error, okay? And you see that in the logistic regression, I'm trying to just maximize the likelihood that my uh, prediction is gonna be good, right? So there are some advantages to it. So for example, the logistic regression usually converges faster, right? Because like, if I don't care about the op uh, optimal hyperplan, but all I care about is to make sure that I have uh, as low loss as possible. Uh, use, as we saw before, there are several ways to solve this problem, right? So like, if all I care is to find the classifier that works, right? I had several options. So if I try to find the optimal one, then that usually takes a little longer, right? I think that's pretty intuitive, right? That if I'm trying to find the optimal one, usually that's gonna take a little longer, okay? So, but the logistic regression has another issue, right? Uh, which that uh, the logistic regression, as, as probably you guys recall, uh, has a logarithm inside of this uh, loss function, right? So 
what does it imply to, right? That means that if I keep optimizing this loss function until I obtain uh, error zero, am I ever gonna get to zero? What, what's, uh, do I have a log of something that's equal to zero? No, right? So that, that's a issue because essentially what it means that like by aiming to uh, have uh, zero loss, right? I will be just keep like uh, doing iterations in my data, right? And as I keep doing these iterations necessarily, I start to increase the weight of this, uh, the, the weight that's defining my hyper, my hyper plan, right? And that's essentially something that we don't want, right? Because we want this problem to be as uh, controlled as possible, right? So imagine that like I have this hyper plan and then I keep forcing it to have the loss zero, right? And then it starts oscillating faster, 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 and then it explodes. And then suddenly I have something that just looks like garbage, right? So one thing that you have to do when you're using logistic regression is usually to set like, what's the tolerance that you're willing to go? So like how low in, in loss you want to go before we stop. Otherwise you're just gonna diverge from the optimal solution from a solu a, any solution, okay? So those are a few things that usually we have to keep in mind when using lo logistic regression. So logistic regression is one that I never use for anything, honestly, so. Good. So I, I don't want to get too much in details of logistic regression. First, because I don't like logistic regression. And second, because uh, logs already uh, covered that. Okay. A any more, any other comments here? So, so if not, uh, I, I, I'm going to bring back to one observation that Pepe did, which was very important which is that all these problems in the end, they are trying to solve a linear issue, right? Which like, I'm trying to find a combination of weights, uh, a set of weights that when I transform this uh, input data that I have the axis, right? They are gonna get closer to something that I say is my ideal classification, right? So in the end of the day, they are all using uh, linear regression as a backbone, okay? And just to make sure, because like linear regression, really it's the, the soul of uh, machine learning, I would say, you know, there is even this uh, very famous uh, tweet that was done by uh, Yosha Benjo that says like, tell me where you were when you realized that machine learning is just linear regression. <laughs> because like the, mo most of the things that we're gonna talk about with respect to, uh, like optimization problems and so on, you know, like they are stacks of smaller linear regression problems. Okay. And with that in mind, let me ask you something that's uh, actually a uh, very, uh, so something that's not everyone stops to think about, right? So like most of these problems that I have been telling you about so far, there were two classes, right? So I was trying to separate class one from zero or like red circles from blue squares, right? How would they use this method to solve a classification problem for three classes? Anyone has any idea of how that would work? Using just things that we have seen so far, how can I extend these uh, methods that we discuss to three classes instead of two? I kind of gave the answer in my previous statement but I want to see if anyone was paying attention. No? You, Any crazy you may, ideas? Uh, you may, yeah, oh. please. You, you may change uh, the, the shape of the hyper, hyperplane. Instead of a line, it can be curved. This, this change the shape of the hyperplane. But can I separate three classes with a single hyperplan? You could combine two classes together and then separate them afterwards. Wow, that's that's good. That's good. So essentially, that's that's what we do, right? So what if I say that first I want to separate class A from B and C, right? 
So for the first pass, right? I say that B and C are just one big class and I want to separate B and C from A, right? Then I find a hyperplane there. Now I want to separate A and B from C. I find another hyperplane there, right? Can I separate three classes with two hyperplanes? Whoever suggested the solution, please tell me if I can. Was that Sebastian? No? You, uh, yes, I think you can distinguish them with two hyperplanes. Yes, I can. Yes, that, that's what I was ask, asking for. I want to like a very affirmative yes. Yes, I can. So if I had four classes, I need three hyperplanes, right? And then I can separate everything. Good? Is that intuitive to everyone? So basically what you do when you have more classes is we stack more of those problems. But they're, again, they're all essentially solving a linear problem on their own, right? Is that clear for everyone? Yes, as the, the complexity of the multidimensional then, then is getting complicated to, to visualize, but the concept is that the one. concept is yeah. pretty okay. simple, cool. right? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And good. I, I hope everyone is in the same page here, but feel free to send questions or just unmute yourself and ask questions. Okay. But so since we agree, right? I hope we all agree that uh, in the end of the day, we are just solving a linear regression issue, right? I want to make sure that we have the concepts of linear regression very strongly uh, placed in our set of tools because linear regression is going to show up again. Like, for example, we already have seen that linear regression is support a vector machine, is in logistic regression, uh, and it's going to be in perceptron, it's going to be in deep neuronal networks, and so on. So, like, I want to make sure that we are all talking in the same language here. Okay. I don't think linear regression is in uh, decision trees or random forests, right, Pepe? Not really, because they identify threshold, no? Yeah, it's just a set of thresholds, right? Several So thresholds. there is not a, a real weight uh, that yeah. is a coefficient or many coefficients. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's working in another way, yeah. So it's, it's, I don't think that the backbone is is really linear regression over there, but we can we can have a look through it. Yeah. So it's like brutal force is really brutal force, right? It's like it's trying it, thresholds here and there until you finally find something that solves the problem. Yes, yes. It's a is a bit completely different from the approach of from this kind of support vector machine or the other one like Mars multi adaptive regression spline and um, so is is really different. Yes. Good. Okay, let's move on then. All right, so we're going to have this extremely quick review on linear regression. Actually, you're going to tell me how linear regression works uh, because I'm pretty sure you all know how it works. So I'm going to give to you this data set, okay, that it consists of like X observations, right, that have uh, any features or predictors. So like, that that's like a set of it's a table essentially right with uh, like several observations which are the rows and i have all these uh columns which are in columns right which are my features right for that i have this set of weights w right which basically they are telling me how i should combine the these features in order to obtain like a good prediction okay so now from what we have seen so far, right? You guys remember that statement that like kind of summarize all machine learning all together, which says that like for a task T, right? I had to find the right metric that I want to optimize, right? P, which basically stands for the performance, right? And we saw that there were a few options there, right? For example, some of the performance metrics that we want to use might be the R square, for example, might be the mean square error, the mean absolute error. If we're talking about a classification, we were talking about the accuracy of the classifier, right? So like, usually like people talk of cross entropy, binary cross entropy, but if it's a regression, what's the performance that I want to use here? Anyone can give me the, the right metric?
how do I how do I measure how good my regressor is doing? In you mean the R squared? R squared, yeah. Mean mean square error? Is that what someone said? The R squared. The R squared is one of them, right? Uh, the dif the difference is that it's like when I'm uh, optimizing for R square, I want to maximize R square, right? So like then the problem is different. But like for uh, the sake of like minimizing a loss function, usually we use the mean square error, okay? But like yeah, it's it's a metric. The R square is a metric. But for the sake of like the explanation, I'm going to stick to the mean square error, right? I think someone sent something on the on the chat. chat. Yeah, I see someone else said R square. Good. Great. Yeah. So R square, right? So how the R the the mean square error. So how the mean square error works? Essentially, I obtain an output. For my model, which here I'm saying this is the white test. Okay, I compare to the true uh, to the true measurement or the target, right? And for each one of these entries that I have in my table, which I'm saying that I have i uh, entries, right? So like I have i observations, I compute the square of this error, right? And that's why it's the uh, square error, right? And where the mean comes in. The mean comes in in like, I'm gonna do that. Like it's a mean over all the errors that I computed. Good, very good. So now if I'm saying that I want to obtain a error zero, what does it mean? Okay, so like, just like, so we can have a picture in our minds, this is the regression that we're trying to perform, right? So here I have like some data points, as you can see. This is how my, uh, like this feature X that I'm showing here correlates to an output, okay? So here, like it's an extremely simple regression problem. So ideally, right, I'm gonna be playing around with these weights, right? That uh, tells me uh, how I should be combining the features of the data, right? Here, for example, since I only have one feature, so I only have one bit to, to play with. Uh, there is some noise happening. Maybe if everyone can mute themselves, just to make sure. Yeah, yeah they did, they did. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah, so now I want to find this the weight that's gonna give me the lowest loss, right? The lowest mean square error, right? So I could empirically just be moving around with this uh, error, right? In, uh, with this weight and verify how big is the error that I'm measuring, right? And then finally, I would see that at some point, changing further away from this minimal point here, from this minimal location, would just increase my error, right? So empirically, we should be able to estimate what is this uh, error, uh, what's the optimal weight that's gonna give me the lowest error, right? But since uh, this uh, error, uh, the, the way how my weight, is related to my error. It's such a nice shape, right? You see that's like sort of this parabolical shape. I can very well just say that I want this, uh, the weight that gives me the minimal error, okay? And for those of you who remember calculus, <laughs> I, I want you to tell me which- uh, Where is the point? Yeah, sorry? Where is the point? Where is this point? If yeah. I want to say that I want to inspect this loss function, which as I said, this loss function here, right? Is essentially conditioning the shape that we're observing here. I want to find the minimal loss, right? So like as low as, as I can go for a given weight. I want to find the weight that's gonna give me the minimal loss. How do I do that? Anyone that's like fresh on concepts of calculus could help me here. You derive. I could derive, right? Excellent. Anyone knows which? What's the symbol that I'm showing here? This inverted triangle.
so this is the gradient okay so the gradient it's essentially the derivative of the loss function with respect to the weights right so if i'm saying that the loss it's minimal at this point right i'm expecting the derivative in this point to be equal to zero zero excellent very good so very good is that clear for everyone any questions here Okay, so this solves very well linear problems, right? As you can imagine. But you're going to see that there are several other problems that they're not linear, right? Then we have to use more complex stuff, which is why I still have a job, because like if you could solve everything with linear regression, nobody would <laughs> pay me to do anything. So yes, there, there is just so much the linear regression can do for you, but like, it gives you like such cool properties and you're gonna see some of them, right? So for example, uh, this is just for those that are like, oh, but this is just like one variable, right? So like, we're just talking about having just an X and finding the, the weight that gives me the best regression, right? The best uh, uh, mean square error, the lowest mean square error in this case, right? But how would that work for more variables? Exactly the same thing, right? So for example, if you're dealing with like two variables now, then we have this uh, loss function that would lo look like this sort of bow, right? And one concept that I would like you to keep in mind as we go forward is how convex the loss is, okay? And why is that important? Because the convex, right, essentially stands for this bow shape, right? And if I say that the problem is convex, it's great because there are several things that we can observe here. So first of all, there is just one minimal point in a convex shape, right? I don't have two minimal locations, right? Two areas that also could present like uh, two good solutions for the problem. So I just have one solution, which is excellent, right? That means that I can stop when I reach this point of like the greatest solution in the universe, right? So like I can just stop there. Uh, and there are things that we do, we go out of our way just to ensure that the problem can be described as being convex, because if it's convex, I can find a unique solution for that, right? And I hope you can appreciate that finding a unique solution is great for several reasons. So for example, let's say that there are like two points that they equally uh, present solutions, right, for the problem but uh, they might just result in completely different out outcomes if I apply them like to solve the problem. I, I wish I had a great example to, to tell you now uh, of when that could happen. Uh, that, that's gonna come to my mind early, uh, later today, but if anyone can have like an example in mind that you'd like to mention like when two, uh, initial conditions that could perhaps like represent solution for our problems, they would lead to completely different outcomes. No, perhaps in weather, yeah. perhaps in weather, we could say that there is such thing. Yeah, it doesn't come to my mind now, but yeah, let's see. But yeah, anyways, if it comes to anyone's mind, otherwise, like if it's like a cool example pops in my mind, I, uh, I, I say later, okay? Very good. Antonio, so, like, one question. Yeah. Can you can you link? So, the 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 formula before you were saying that derivative. Mm -hmm. Yes, the derivative is is the gradient. The so derivative is the gradient. Yes. The, the, the derivative is the gradient. So we mm -hmm. are trying to when you say we are trying to minimize the loss function means we are trying to reach the derivative equal to zero. And the mm -hmm. gradient, so the gradient equal to z. The gradient of, of this function to be equal to zero. Yes. Okay, perfect. Just to be sure. Yeah. And, and why I'm talking about the gradient here? Because like you just said, that's the derivative of this function, right? But the gradient, it's with respect to all the variables that you have, right? So for example, the gradient uh in this case is just the derivative of this loss function with respect to w1, right? But let's say that I have like a problem that has more dimensions. So like I have W1, 2, 3, 4, and, and so on, right? So that would be the derivative of this function 
with respect to W1, then this function is with respect to W2 and so on, right? And that's essentially what the gradient summarizes to us. Just says that's like the derivative of this function with respect to all the variables that they have, okay? Okay, so is is yes, is including is including all the derivative for each single variable. Uh, okay, root mean square. Okay, I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. Any other questions? My allergies are killing me today. From my when I took like calculus, I remember that the derivative was the area under the the curve, right? No, or that's I don't know integral. if that's the integer. Yeah, that's the integral. Okay. So what we're trying to find is like the lowest point or the closest to zero or just the zero. For me, that concept is a bit uh, strange. I didn't I didn't catch it as well. So the, the derivative, right? So the derivative here means the point where I'm gonna have the lowest loss, right? Because that means that at this point here, I'm I'm granted to have. Uh, the derivative here is just like a parallel line, right? That's going to be fully horizontal there, you see? So I, I wish I had a, the blackboard. That, that, those are the moments when online lectures- uh, like, Antonio, just the right, is the tangent. So it's the, the tangent, tangent. So yeah. Is everyone familiar with this concept? The tangent? Yes, it's the curve? tangent. Okay, yeah, great, so yeah. The tangent, you know, in this, in this curve changing, mm -hmm. I to find a pen, so maybe you can help me, Antonio. Uh, it, it changes the tangent can change. Uh, it goes from. Does this work? Oh, it works! Uh, Excellent. Yeah. Perfect. Bravo. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that like, one is the first tangent. Yeah. Right. So here I have a tangent to the curve. Okay, but the the derivative basically tells me what's the slope, right? Yeah. So like the slope here, it's negative. Here it is slightly less negative, and here the slope is equal to zero, right? So I I say that the the point where I have the minimum of the curve, it's whenever I have the slope of this line, which uh, given to me as the derivative of this curve in this point is equal to zero, right? And as I keep moving the opposite direction, now I have a slope that's positive, right? which is also something that I, I don't want because I'm only interested in the point where the slope, which is like the tangent to the curve is equal to zero. And in that moment, as you can see empirically here, is gonna be the point where I have uh, the minimum of the curve. And what about if there is a maximum? Ah, I was going to ask that later, but yeah, excellent. Okay, so that, you have to that, take care of yourself, I guess. Yeah, so if I have like, a curve that looks like that. That's something that I was going to ask later, but since we're very touch on this topic, if I say that I'm looking for the derivative equal to zero, right? I have a derivative equal to zero here, one here, and one here, right? So you see that like for something that's a bit more complex, so like, that, that's why I was uh, also hinting to you, like the importance of trying to make your loss function convex, right? Because this is convex and this is no longer convex, right? So if I can force my loss function to be as convex as possible, that's good. Then I'm happy, right? But, but how do you do that in uh, many nonlinear many dimensions? Ah, glad you asked. We are going to see that in a few slides. Good. How do I go back to just regular pointer? Oh, the thing is going to stay there forever now. Okay. <laughs> uh, there will be where, it, where you click. I think there will be also, because I think you, you can do it if you are sharing, not if I'm not. Mm. Anyways, so, no is problem. Just for the training part of the process, Mm hmm okay yes yes Good point. Yeah. yeah but now because this is a convex problem right I, I can i can do something even better right because like it's a convex problem so i know that there is a solution right 
uh, for this problem that I was describing to you here, right? So it's a convex problem. I didn't tell you how I managed to get it to be convex, as Sebastian very well pointed out. And but like assuming at this point that the problem is convex, okay? Because we are all friends here, right? So like let's let's start by the easy example first. So like we are, uh, I'm saying that like this is a convex problem. So what I'm trying to do is to find this uh, set of weights W, right? That when I multiply that by my uh, observations, the X, I obtain something that is uh, minimize this loss function, which again, as you can see, this is my prediction. So that's the F of X. So these are the weights that I'm trying to find that I'm gonna multiply to my observations. Here I'm adding a bias because sometimes a bias helps, but most of the case you can just consider it to be zero. So it just disappears from the equation. And when I compare the two, if this is good enough, I should get uh, uh, estimates that's very close to my target, Y, right? So like you see that this is supposed to be shrinking as I get closer and closer to the ideal weights, right? And I, I get, once again, this is the square of the error. So this is the mean square error, okay? Good. Actually it's not because I forgot to put the one over M here. I was wrong. You guys did it correct me. So, so like you, you see that like, yeah, but it's the e square error, right? Uh, now I'm gonna try to find the weights that minimize this function for me, okay? And as we all concluded in the previous slide, I'm gonna find the optimal weight whenever I have the derivative of this uh, problem that I set up up here, right? To find this f of x, uh, the derivative of this loss function uh, with respect to my weight is equal to zero, right? So now I can just solve that, okay? So very quickly. So if I get this equation here and I break it down like as a product, because that's the square, right? And they're all matrices here. And I can just break it down as a two multiplications, as you can see, okay? Uh, then I can expand that, right? So like, that's just the product as you can observe probably, okay? So uh, I'm assuming that you're all comfortable with that. So this is equal to this because just the product of the elements, okay? No tricks here. Now I want to find the derivative equal to zero. So I'm gonna derivate this equation, which I just told you is just the expansion of this, this product that came from the mean square error, okay? Please stop me if you're getting confused at any point, but I hope uh, those things are... Antonio, the T stay for? Transpose. Oh, okay. Yeah, because they're matrices, right? So like, if I want to, if I say that I want the square of any matrix, I, I can't multiply the matrix by itself. I have to multiply the matrix by the transpose of the matrix. Mm. Yeah. And again, those are things that are coming from linear algebra. Uh, I, I hope you all got the chance to, ha to have a quick review on the material that I sent in the beginning of the course in April, I think, right? But like, those are all concepts from linear algebra that I, I hope you're all comfortable with at this point. Okay, good. So now I'm gonna compute the derivative, right? So this is W square because I have a W here and I have a W here, right? So the derivative of this uh, element here with respect to W would be 2W because that was W square. This, this two comes down. Then I have the product of the uh, X transposed by X. And very good, right? So here, the second component only has one W. So you see that the W, when I do the derivative of this with respect to W, that one W disappears, okay? And this component here has no W. So the derivative of a constant with respect to any variable, it's always zero, right? So like that term disappears. Then at this point, it's just like simple algebra, right? So I move elements to the other side and I isolate the W that I'm looking for, okay? Then I obtain this. So what is this? What is this W that I just found right here? Can anyone tell me what that is for the problem that I was trying to solve? Oh, 
Okay, the W stay was for the weight. The W was for the weight, but not any weight. It's a specific weight. Is the weight that minimize this okay. loss function? What was this loss function that I was trying to minimize? I mean, the, the derivatives. We were trying to arrive to derivative equal to zero. Yeah, this is the mean square error. Let, let's yeah. let's keep in mind what was the problem. This is the mean square error, correct? So this is the combination of the set of weights that when I multiply to my observations, right? They get me as close as possible to the true observations, right? So if I have this to be nearly zero, right? This difference, that means that I have a, a loss or an error that's borderline zero. So if I have a very small error, that means that my, pre my prediction that's given by the weights that I just found, they're the best that I can find, right? And we said that like, okay, so if that's the case, I can just look for the derivative equal to zero here, right? And that's what we're looking for at this point. Good, are we all on the same page? So what we did was to break this into this equation, right? Which is still the error, the square error, right? And now I'm gonna find the point, the W, right, which we said that this W is the one that's gonna give me the derivative equal to zero. And we want that because that is the lowest loss. So I found the minimal loss. So that's the best weight that I can find for this problem. Is that clear for everyone? So this is n-dimensional linear regression. Is this your linear regression, but for a data that's any dimension? Yes. So it's not only two dimensional, it's n dimensional. Yeah. N dimensions. And the, the matrix has then the size of the dimensions, let's say. Uh, correct. That's, that's correct. Okay. So answering the question, this is the weight that I was looking for. This is the weight in which the derivative is equal to zero, right? So I said that like I'm solving this equation, which says that the derivative of this is equal to zero. I perform the derivative and then I isolate the weight. So this is the weight that gives me the derivative if equal to zero. Therefore, is the point of lowest loss. I'm not sure what the uh, what the weight is at all. So is that the parameter space, or I mean, is that sort of uh, optimized parameters then at the end? Yeah, these are the, the vectors, right? That I'm going to use to multiply to my observations. Okay. Yes, it's nothing else. The, the, the residuals, the residual. So if you, Antonio, if you go back in some slide, you can see that the weight is nothing else in the distance between the line and the point. Yeah, so the line and the point, that one are the weights. So in our case, we call it them residuals from the model. We are trying to minimize the residuals. But then you have a weight for every point. Yes. Yeah. And that's why. For every I'm feature, not... right? For every yeah, for feature, every feature. For every yeah. Yeah, 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 correct. Uh, it's a weight for every feature. Ah, OK. Good. So this is like the optimal weight for this problem. OK? I, I think that's the only thing that I want you guys to take from this slide, that this is the optimal weight. So like for a linear regression problem, which we defined here, right? We said that like the best metric for performance would be like the mean square error. So we wrote it down here, right? Now the mean square error, right? It's the comparison between what's my uh, estimate of a good set of weights that I can use to multiply to my data, right? That when I compare this prediction, which is the W times the X, when I compare this prediction to the actual value, I get as close as possible to the actual value. So like I expect this subtraction here to be as close as possible to zero because I want those two values to be very close to each other, okay? Then I, I want to find this set of weights, W, that when I do this multiplication, they are gonna get me as close as possible to the Y, to my target, okay? Then what we said here is that I can 
decompose this thing into this equation because it's just easier, right? I remove this summation, I remove this square and have all the terms like written down in a very clean way for us, right? Because this is easier to do the derivative, right? So here I do this derivative. I said here that like, I'm looking for the, the point in which this derivative is equal to zero because the lowest loss, okay? So I can say that the derivative at any point, like the point that's gonna give me the best weight is equal to zero in that point, right? I computed the derivative of this equation, which is this, okay? Now, if I want to find the W that solves this equation that is equal to zero, right? I, all I have to do is to isolate the W now. So I pass this term to the other side. I have this two, I divide by two both sides. Then I have this, right? Now I can just pass this X transpose X to the other side, which is like, it's why you have this minus one because it's a division, okay? And here now I have this W, which is exactly this W that gives me the best loss, the lowest loss, you see? So like, I, I can precisely point to you what's the weight that's gonna give me the best fit to the curve by just computing these, uh, uh, these derivatives here, okay? If that's not entirely clear to you, uh, you feel free to ask more questions. Uh, I, this is just like to explain to you why linear regression, it's so good because like very simple to find the right solution, even without any interaction, right? Because like the other option that we had was to just say, okay, I'm gonna try this weight. Like, okay, the error is just too, too big. Now I'm gonna try this W, this W. This W, this W. I'm gonna do that several times until it, I finally see that, okay, if I keep moving along to higher and higher weights, I'm just gonna start increasing the error. So like, I'm just gonna to stick to this one because it was the lowest one. Or I can be smarter, right? And use calculus in my advantage, which is like, I know that in this point here, the uh, derivative is equal to zero. So like, why not just go straight for the solution, right? Which is what we found here. Is that good? Yes, I think we reach a good understanding of the problem. Did we? Yes, better than before. Okay. Any questions? I'm gonna ask one more time. <laughs> I, I see very confused faces on, on your cameras here. Okay. okay you mentioned that you sent some uh, materials on linear algebra in April. Can you maybe remind the name and where we find it? I will do. Yeah, I will, I will do after the class today. I was just looking for it. It's in the in the Slack mm -hmm. on April fifth. I just searched for it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I was also looking for it. But I think I, I don't think we have to solve these matrices, right? This Python will do this for us. Or... No, no, yeah, we don't have to solve the matrices. Like Python is gonna do all of this stuff for you. You know, I just think it's important for you to understand what Python is doing because Python is not a black box, right? You, you have to understand the minimal of like what Python is doing for you. So when things don't work, let, let's put it like this. I can give you the car keys, right? And you're gonna drive it for thousands of miles. But when things break down, you're gonna open the hood, you don't have any idea of like, what's the problem there, right? You can go ask for roadside assistance, which like, let me go ask for a data scientist to solve this problem to me, right? But like in this case, you guys are the data scientists now, right? So you're the mechanic. You, you should be able to understand what's wrong with these models, right? So like, so you can fix it. So that, that's my, I'm training the mechanics here. <laughs> yeah, good uh, analogies. Also because they are very important and we will see to understand all the parameter inside to tuning for getting the, the best performance of uh, exactly, yeah. of the neural network. That's why you need, we need to understand a bit what is going on. Yeah, and th that's just like the minimal, right? Like we're not gonna go into like very deep understanding of like deep neuronal nets or anything. This is just linear regression at this point, right? So like, we're just like 
trying to uh, make solid the base of like what linear regression can do for us, which like to offer this very neat uh, solution for linear regression problems. So like, what's the beauty of it, right? So like for this problem, which like has, it's a mean square error problem, right? I can just, instead of like trying to solve by empirically guessing what's the best weight, which is essentially what I was saying before. Oh, let me use this weight. Now this one, this one, this one. We can both agree that at some point you are gonna find the, the right weight, right? Perhaps not the exact one, because like there are just so many things you can try with respect to like how many options of weights you can try. But if you have infinite time in your hands, you're gonna find the best solution, right? But like on the other, the, the other way of solving that is by solving the, the equation of the, the error, which is gonna give you the right, exact, precise, best in the world ever solution for the problem. Okay. Okay, just, uh, it's already, we already have been talking for one hour and a half. Like, wanna have a break? Yeah, let, let's have a break. Uh, we come back at uh, 45. Yeah, and in the meantime, like, so Sebastian said that he already found the review material, right, Sebastian? Yes, maybe I can, uh, but you maybe. put it on, can I upload or share file? What's it? No, copy link. Oh. You can upload one. Okay, more I time. can try to yeah. copy the link and post it here. Mm -hmm. Sure, put to bed any questions with respect to derivatives because I was, I was not feeling very assured that everyone understood what I was talking about. So I built this little quiz here that I, I want you guys to solve with me. Uh, let me put in full mode. Okay, can you guys see the full slide now? Yes. Perfect. So I I'm giving to you guys a function f of x, okay, which is essentially this curve that we're seeing here. Okay, you guys can see my mouse, right? Yes. Now I have a couple of points in which I would like to compute the derivative of this curve, which is going from A to K, okay? So I'm gonna ask for a couple of questions with respect to what, of what's the value of the derivative in some of those points, okay? So here in the chat, I want you, each one of you to write to me in which points along this curve I have the derivative if equal to zero. Look that, observe that I, I'm not asking for the, the points of maximum or minimum. I'm just saying the derivative equal to zero. And I'm gonna give you 10 seconds to answer to me before I, I answer. Very good. Very good. I think we have been 10 seconds. Bam, bam. Okay. So great. So now I see that most people said B. Okay. The derivative is equal to zero there. D, F, H, J. Some people didn't put the J, but Probably my, my location of the J was not the optimal, but yeah, it's supposed to be on the top of the hill here. Now, some people put K, some people didn't put the K. What do you guys think? I would like someone to comment on that if possible. Uh, it's not static. It's not static? Is that the German word, static? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay i but, have to translate let's see. No, yeah no need. just try to describe what you mean by static uh it, it uh, it's an abrupt change it's not a it's not a, a gradual change it's not a gradual so change. it's not defined the gradient is would be not defined there or it's, infinite or something like this is discontinuous f is discontinuous. discontinuous okay yeah ah, great great and by being discontinuous that means that i the derivative is not equal to zero. 
the derivative is not defined there, as you said very well. Right, you right. Trying to put questions in your mind. You, you said it's right in the first time. <laughs> okay, yeah, great. Yeah, sorry. So why is it not defined? I would like someone else besides Sebastian to try to tell me why it's not I defined. think the translation of stat static is uh, steady. I don't know if that's the right mathematical term, but that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. Steady or continuous, uh, yes, you say, yeah. Yeah. But steady is difficult to talk about because we're not describing a dynamic system necessarily, right? So, but like this continues would be the case here. So let me see if I add a pin. Okay, this works. So why K is not defined? Anyone else besides Sebastian could perhaps help me to say why K wouldn't have derivative equal to zero? Because the tangent can't continuously approach the point and then go the other side, other side up again. Like as we saw before when you did it in the... Yeah. That could be explanation, but the, the thing that I'm looking for specifically is, is to show you guys that like I don't have one single tangent to the point K, right? Like the derivative of a curve should be unique, right? So if it's not unique, then it's not defined, right? Because like how many tangents I can trace on K? I can have this one. I can have that one. I can have that one. So it's not defined. Right, so like, doesn't make sense to say that what's the der derivative in k because f becomes discontinuing that point. That was just a tricky one since I knew that everyone would get the the other derivatives equal to zero, right? So like, very quickly before we move on because we're running out of time. <laughs> so where the derivatives are positive in this curve? Ten, nine, eight, seven. Okay, I see some answers coming in. Okay. Perfect. You guys understand that. So I'm going to assume that you all are. Okay. Okay, yeah. I'm happy. I think we all understand what the derivatives are there, right? And I, I hope you can understand now as well that the points of minima. Although the points of maxima in this curve are also zero, but the points of minima are zero. Okay. Now, how we did differentiate the points of maxima and minima? That's something that you're going to discuss later. But for now, I'm satisfied that you know that the derivative is equal to zero in those points. Okay. Great. I think I I, I hope we we have these uh, concepts like solidified in our minds now because we're going to need those. Just, just so, so for curiosity, right? Because like we we know other types of regression out there, right? So like some of the other popular methods of the regression that you might have heard about is the ridge regression, right? And like what's the difference between the linear regression that we described here, that's linear regression, right? To this type of uh, ridge regression. So you see that the function is exactly the same. So like I'm also trying to minimize this loss. This term, it's exactly absolutely exactly the same term of loss that we saw for the linear regression, right? The difference is that now I also have this constraint on the weight, okay? So you see that like the weight, the magnitude of the weight that I have for the, uh, that for the proposed solution, they are also incorporating the loss that needs to be minimized, okay? So like I also want to have the, uh, the weights to be as, as small as possible, okay? And why is that the case, okay? Oh, just one more example before we move on. So like there is this, also this type of regression that's called the Lasso regression, which is also pretty popular, right? Where you see that once again, the loss function, which like how we compute the difference between this approximation of the uh, real phenomena, as we were discussing before, which stands for finding the best set of weights that combined with the features of my data is gonna get me as close as possible to my target, right? And then the regularization here, it's on the absolute of the weights instead of the quadratic of the weights, okay? So a few things. So for example, the uh, ridge regression, 
it still allows us to use this closed form solution. So like, as you remember in the previous slide, I told you that like, if I use the linear regression, I'm perfectly capable of saying, okay, I don't need to iterate over all the possible weights in the universe to find the best weight for my problem here, right? Because for a simple linear regression problem, right? Assuming that's convex, right? I have a closed form solution, which like, I can just get the data by itself. So like X is my data, observations by features, right? So like samples by features with the true value that I'm trying to approximate. And then I can like in one pass, find the exact weights that I should be using to solve that problem. With the lasso regression, I cannot do that because now I have an independent term that like if I compute the derivative of that, right? This weight disappears and then I just have a constant. Right. So but anyways, I did just to, to let you know. So you see that like these other fancier methods of regression, they are exactly the same, just adding one more constraint. That's all I wanted to let you know. It's pure curiosity here. Okay. Very well. So like one thing that Sebastian asked uh, in the first half of the lecture was like, okay, but like, how do we ensure that the problem is convex in the first place? So there are a few things, few choices that we can make in order to ensure su such thing. Okay. So for example, let's say that we have two features, right? So like here I'm illustrating two features. In most cases, features, they might present some degree of correlation, right? Let's say that for example, I have, tell me two geographic features that's usually are very correlated, like in the data sets that you guys come across. So like, if you know one, most likely you're gonna know the other as well. Clouds yeah, and rain. <laughs> Cloud and rain. rain. Perfect. Yeah. Temperature and precipitation. Uh, sorry. Uh, temperature and elevation. We mentioned the other day. Yeah. So so uh, let, let's go for clouds and rain, right? So like most often when I have clouds, I also have rain. I'm assuming that's the correlation that you're proposing there, right? So like if I know that there is cloud, do I need to look at rain? Most most often I don't. Okay, so this could be a perfectly good solution. Okay, but if I have that happening, let's assume that like, okay, so I could just disregard completely the fact if there is rain or not for, for like this very uh, simple example that we're giving here, because I can just look if there is cloud, right? Now, what happens when the variable cloud is corrupted? My prediction is gonna be garbage because I'm fully biased by the existence of cloud, right? So one of the things that you can make to make uh, your model more robust is try to distribute the weights that you, you assign for each one of these features, right? So like, that's one of the things that we're trying to constantly do here by imposing these constraints on weights, right? So we don't do that simply because we want the weights to be as small as possible, but because doing that, you make the model more robust to uh, like small perturbations, noise in one of the measurements and so on, okay? And more importantly than that, when you do such thing, you also, and I hope you just take me by my word because I'm not gonna prove it here now, but I can share, just send you some material. By doing so, by ensuring that these uh, weights there is small and distributed, you also enforce uh, the convexity of the problem, right? So if you're enforcing the convex of the problem, we're trying to get as close as possible to this thing, because this thing, uh, allows us to do like a very clean uh, exploration of the loss landscape and makes our life easier of finding the optimal set of ways that you need to solve the problem. Good? Sebastian, all good? Sorry, I have to admit I had, I had just a phone call. I didn't listen, sorry. Ah, okay. You can see the recording later. You don't need to uh, repeat. <laughs> okay, good. Very good. So now we have the expectation, which is like, okay, we expect our loss curves to be just like that, right? But the reality is that when you come across like real data out there in the wild, the, these loss functions, they don't look as clean and organized as the one on the left, okay? So these are, it's a real uh, loss function, what you see in the right here. And when you have that, you have some challenge, right? Because first of all, if I am looking for point of the derivative that's equal to zero, right? 
I'm going to find several points of the derivative equal to zero. You see, like here, for example, it's like a point of local maximum, even, you know, it's, it's lower than the uh, outmost parts of this uh, area, right? But this is like high, right? But like when I'm trying to find the optimal solution visually, I see that it's going to lay in this valley down here, right? So like trying to use linear regression in this case and use the only parameter, this derivative if equal to zero doesn't work necessarily, okay? So like you see that like the, although the linear regression allow you to find precisely what's the solution for the problem, it makes several assumptions that most often doesn't hold to be true, okay? And that's when you need to start escalating the, the caliper of the gun that we're gonna use to, to tackle this type of the problems, okay? And that's the motivation for us to get to perceptions. Okay, perception. So we're gonna start at least perceptions. Let's see how far we go with it. Uh, so uh, in, in this textbook, right? Uh, Nielsen, he uh, described the perception with a very interesting take, which that first he made an observation, right? Which that, uh, I don't know how familiar you guys are with logical circuits, right? Probably you have heard at least of like the end gate, right? which says that if I have uh, one and one, the output of that end gate should be the combination of both, right? So like if I have one and one, the output is one. If I have zero and one, the output is zero. If I have one and zero, the output is zero. And if I have zero and zero, the output is zero. So the only condition in which I have act, uh, uh, output one is if both are equal to one. Okay, so that's the traditional end gate. Okay, so then you have other types of gates. The one that inverts the input. So you have one, the output is zero. If you have zero, the output is one. Then you have the or, right? Which is like, if I have zero and zero, the output is zero. If I have zero and one, the output is one. The other way around, if I have one and zero, the output is still one. And if I have one and one, the output is one, okay? So I had these three different types of gates, but then Nielsen, or like very nicely he puts in his book, you can very well replace each one of these gates by just a NAND gate, which like you, you basically, you invert the output of the gate, okay? So the NAND gate can replace all these others. Like you, you, you just get more components as you can observe, but like you can still approximate any type of logical circuit by just n gates, okay? And the cool thing that uh, Nielsen observed there is that we can very well think of a perception as being an end gate. Therefore, an end gate, it's a universal computational machine. And what's the implication of that? Basically what Nielsen is saying is that like, doesn't matter how complicated the problem is, right? The best that I'm going to get to uh, approximate to a solution is via a stack of perceptions, okay? Just like the NAND gates. So like, it doesn't matter if like it's an OR gate, an AND gate, an invert buffering gate, or something way more complicated, like we have in our cell phones nowadays with like billions of microchips. Doesn't matter. I can replace each one of these gates by an end gate, although it's going to be a bit messier because like instead of having one gate, I need three now to perform exactly the same function. But if I have in my two, two box only NAND gates, I can solve any problem that you throw me, okay? And Nielsen is saying that like essentially the perception does the same thing. So like doesn't matter how complicated the function is, okay? And look how bold is this statement that I'm making right now. Doesn't matter how complicated this function is, I can still approximate that by a perception, okay? Let me put the camera back here because I want to see your faces. Okay, anybody shocked by my statement? No, apparently not. <laughs> I have a basic question. Yeah. So what does invert buffering means? Ah, yeah, that's a... Uh... So invert buffering is simply invert. like what I'm showing here. So for example, if I throw like a logical zero in the, in the uh, input of this 
buffering, I'm gonna obtain a one in the end. And if I throw a one, it's a zero. So it just inverts whatever I put in the, as input. It's simple like that. Okay, thank you. So I am not trying to teach you like electronics here. That, that was just an observation from Newsom, you know? where he says that's like, okay, so I can approximate any logical circuit via NANDs, and a NAND is essentially a perception. Therefore, right, therefore I can use a perception to approximate any type of computation that I want, okay? So that was his uh, ground shaking statement, okay? So what we are saying here is that like, I can combine several perceptions and approximate extremely complicated functions, right? So like, for example, we have seen that like support vector machine, uh, logistic regression, uh, we just uh, went over like linear regression as well and several others, right? The methods for like regression and classification out there, they all break down when you start increasing the number of, uh, observations that you have, the number of samples that were collected and the, the dimensionality of the problem, right? But neuronal networks, they can still make the best out of it because they are universal computation engines, okay? And but when I say that I'm stacking perceptions, right? And like here again, I hope you guys remember from the first lecture, a perception is an approximation of a neuron, right? So like, as you remember, we can very well think of this uh, perception here as being a neuron, right? Where, where here are the dendrites, so like the neurons is like sensing what the other neurons are sending to it. Then it's gonna perform a computation. Should I fire uh, actual potential or not? And that's essentially what we get in the output, right? So if we stack several perceptions, assuming that the perception is a single neuron, then we get large neuronal networks or as people like to, to say nowadays, deep neuronal networks, okay? And those are basically like the uh, building blocks of our modern machine learning nowadays. Ah, are you guys blown away by that, no? No? Did you get whiplash with this transition, no? Okay. Yeah, we, we, we are lost a bit, but anyway, uh, trying to, to, to link in the dot, uh, between this perception and the neural network that you say that each single perception can be a node in the neural network? Correct, yeah. And the mm -hmm. link between the, the perception and the weight and also the weight function, that one I think is something important to understand. Yeah, I haven't explained that yet. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. We are getting there now. I just want you to appreciate that in theory, the perception is gonna be capable to approximate very complex functions. For example, the cosine function of a phenomena that we, we could have, as Sebastian was asking before, because clearly linear regression is not gonna do much for us because like you can't approximate a cosine function, for example, with a linear regression method, right? But like you can stack several perceptions, which like individually they solve like local linear problems, right? and approximate a cosine function if you want, right? And that's one of the things that I do actually in my research, which is like trying to solve mathematical problems using uh, uh, neuronal networks, which I would love to discuss at some point if you guys are interested in that, but uh, let's just stick to the topic here. Yeah, so great. Now, how the perception works, okay? So here I'm listening to you the loss function of a perception, okay? So what is this exactly? What are we looking at right here? Anyone that was paying attention on the first lecture that I gave to you guys in the first half of the lecture today could tell me what's this? We have seen this thing at least 10 times today. No? Okay. This nothing else than uh, linear regression again, right? So this is basically what we're doing here is just to take the inputs, right? 
we multiply those inputs uh, by a set of weights, right? We combine those and you obtain an output, right? What's new for you guys here is this term activation function, which I'm gonna explain in a little bit. But for now, let's just forget about the activation function. But like I want you to appreciate that what the perceptron is doing here is to take the input, right? So like that's the, the dimensionality of the inputs here. We combine that with a set of weights, okay? We obtain an output. Now, how good is that output that I obtained, right? How do I e evaluate how good that output was? So we have a couple of techniques that you can use. The one that we have explored the most so far is the square of the error, right? So I get this output Y. I compare to the true value that was associated to this sample that I, I gave as uh, input, right? And I say, okay, this prediction Y was close or far away from my target Y. So now I'm going to tickle a little bit with this uh, set of weights so that I can approximate better and better to my true value Y, okay? Which just means forever, as we saw before. Is that good to you guys? You see that like so far, if we, you're just like taking, taking out this activation function, that what we're seeing here in front of us is nothing else than a linear regression. I would like to hear a yes or amen from the people who are, <laughs> who are silent. And yes, if, you think really. it's not, if you think it's not, please let me know. And then we can try to address the question. Okay, yes, Antonio, I think we, we get to point more or less. And maybe with exercise, we will try to link back the formulas, you know, and the, the theory mm -hmm. together with the, uh, yes, with exercise. Yeah, I think the symbols and the syntax of the formulas is a little bit confusing, but you should, we should probably just skip it or, yeah, leave it. We have to be brave with the, with the gaps of our knowledge, I think. Okay, yeah, that, that, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, I, I hope the material that uh, Sebastian shared, again, the link to the material, can help you to bridge some of this gap. But if you think it's not enough, I can send more stuff, uh, like the, this refresh. I just keep banging on this key of like, that you guys should understand linear regression, because really that's important for like all machine learning in general. Anything is gonna be based on linear regression. What we do is basically twist stack local linear regressions, okay? And then like how we do that, is basically by taking each one of these elements, the perception, and combining them like in more and more perceptions, okay? So like if you understand one perception, that's gonna make your life easier to understand how I can combine the outputs of several perceptions to approximate a more complex function, okay? But indeed, let's get to the practical part, okay? Can I just ask for something? Yeah, of course. <clears throat> Um, because you have some assumptions when you do linear regression, but often when you hear about machine learning, you, you say that you don't have to care about any normality or whatever. So what is actually <laughs> the right way to think about that? You don't need to care about what, sorry? No, I mean, what's, what's, are there some assumptions if we use, uh, for example, support vector machine, do our residuals have to be normally distributed and I mean, those normal assumptions that we have right. for linear re regression. Right, yeah. So there are a couple of things that are like, first, the assumption is always that the loss uh, that we're going to try to optimize is continuous, right? Because as we saw in that quick example, things get very weird when you have a discontinuous function because essentially you don't have a derivative that's defined in, in all the function, right? all the, the function that we're trying to minimize. So if you have a discontinuous loss function, that's problematic. So like the very first big assumption is that the loss function that you're gonna use for the optimization of the network is continuous, okay? So you can use calculus to try to optimize that. Now there are the things that they're not assumptions, but they are rather things that 
in practical terms, they help you to try to optimize your, your model, right? And one of them is the normalization. So uh, like the normalization that uh, we did for the supporter vector machine is something that like most methods, they benefit from it. Uh, I think Brandon Forest doesn't, right? Because in the end of the day, it's not really trying to optimize anything. It's just like a set of like it else's that you're trying to do, right? They are local decisions. So like you don't need to, to have these uh, normalizations done in the, uh, for Brandon Forest. But for all the other methods that are gradient-based, uh, they all benefit from normalizations. Yes, perfect. And what about collinearity between variables? The what? collinearity, correlation. No, yeah, if you have correlations, right? So for example, here we just saw like an example of like two variables that mm -hmm. were correlated, right? So like, let's say that like in this case, we had two features, right? That were highly correlated. Uh, I think you said climate and something else before. Sebastian. Yeah. Temperature and elevation. Temperature and elevation, right. So we have the, the mode of being optimized, not just to solve the problem, but also to do this balance here, right? So if there is uh, like correlation between the features in the data, the network is gonna try to penalize very big weights like this, right? To always try to distribute it as even as possible. So you, you don't fully discard any feature of the data, right? Because in theory, that's gonna make the problem easier to solve. Because if these uh, weights, they are distributed, right? They're properly distributed. The shape of your loss function is more convex. Therefore, it's easier to solve, right? So like, that's what we're trying to enforce in the problem, right? And I think that was it. You're just, you were just asking about the correlation between the features, right? Or did you ask anything else? Yeah, usually the assumption at, at this, if variable are correlated, normalization of the variables, uh, mainly these two. Mm -hmm. um, so if uh, in neural network, if you have, do you need any variable reduction, for example, if you have many variables? In? You're talking about, about the dimensionality of this. Yeah, uh, dimensionality. Do you need any dimensionality reduction? To, I mean, if you have remember. lower dimension, right? So for example, lower dimension always helps with respect to uh, removing noise, right? So for example, one of the things that people do quite often, let's say that you have uh, 400 features per sample in your data, whatever features you have, right? But you don't need all those features to identify a trend in your data somehow, right? Because like they are uh, highly correlated or so on. So the network should be capable of identifying those features that although they are uh, they can be used, they're not as meaningful. So those they're gonna have lower weights, right? So you can try to speed up the process because the network is still gonna try to account for all those features, right? You can try to speed up the process by per perhaps performing PCA, principal component analysis, to reduce the number of dimensions that you have in your data according to like the explained variance that you'd get with like lower number of dimensions, right? So let's say you go from 400 dimensions to 10 dimensions, and then you see how your problem is gonna perform with those 10 dimensions. So people do that as well. It's not necessarily a thing that boosts performance overall because the neuronal network is gonna be capable of like, uh, discarding those features if they are not really meaningful. Okay, probably you, you gain in computational time because you know- It's it yes. Yeah, yes. okay, get it, yeah. Good? Yeah. Right, so like now the activation function, right? Uh, the activation function, which is this one block here that's between like the uh, weighted average, right? Of like the inputs that you have and the actual output is something that's different from the linear regression, right? So you see that, for example, you might want your output to be in a specific range, right? Which is like why sometimes it's beneficial for you to scale your data to be within a specific range. So for example, that min max scaler that you guys saw in the supporter vector machine was scaling the data to be in a range that's between zero and one, right? 
So for example, if I have my data between zero and one, I don't want my, the output of my neuronal network being capable of modeling outputs that are being between minus infinite and infinite, right? Because I have a, a range of values that I'm trying to achieve, right? Which now after the mean max scalar, it's necessarily between zero and one, you see? So like by imposing those boundaries, by performing the normalization, and then adding the appropriate uh, activation function, you can make the process of like optim uh, optimizing your neuronal network way more efficient, right? Because now I don't waste time guessing like 10 minus 25, 100, right? Because like, I know that my targets, they are between zero and one, and I can enforce that by imposing uh, activation function that projects whatever value is coming here, right? So like I make a decision here, I pass through the activation function. So it maps my output to a specific interval, in our case, zero and one, and then I use that value, right? So the activation function is very handy for that. Of course, there are other cases in which your uh, range might be different. So like it could be by, between minus one and one, or you might just have like uh, values that they can go to like higher values, like beyond one, for example, but you never get negatives, right? So like you, you're not interested in like predicting negative values. So you might want to use this rectified linear unit, which like if it's below zero, it's just zero. And if it's above zero, it scales binary, okay? So that's just like a few tricks that uh, usually can help you a lot with respect to picking data. Antonio, one question. And uh -huh. I can't. I, I didn't see anyone that goes less than minus two. Minus two. Yeah, if you want to go negative, quite a lot. So th that's the thing, right? I if you have data that is between minus infinite, uh, yeah. not minus infinite, and yeah, let's say that you have data that can be anything, going from minus infinite to infinite. <laughs> What do you do? You just don't put an activation function, right? And then it allows you to have going from minus infinity to infinity. Ah, okay. So it's just a linear regression at that point, right? So the activation function, it's something to aid your capacity of modeling the data that you have. Because your data, assuming that is in a specific range, you want your network to be bounded to output things that are also in that range, you see? Yeah, and one point, and for example, the the tangent tan h mm -hmm. goes from minus one to plus one, but can go to any value minus one hundred plus one hundred. Yeah, it can. I mean, those are yeah. things that you're gonna. Let's say that's like so the still, minus one plus one is just a, a symbolic yeah. value. Okay. Because in the end of the day, you can just multiply that by one hundred. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, that's what. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What does maxed out look like? Uh, I, I think there was a question. I just couldn't hear it. Can you increase the volume, Alonso? Yeah, yeah. So what does maxed out mean? So, for example, if you, if you are modeling temperature in Celsius, so the temperature in Celsius can go from minus 50 to plus 50. So you have a boundary that you don't want to overpassing because you know that you don't have temperature more than 50 and less than 50, uh, negative 50. So you can work with a, a tangent, tan H, you know, that goes from minus one to plus one. And of course, by multiply by 50, you can reach the range. I think he was talking about the max out, if I understood the question correctly, right? Ah, the max out, the other one. Ah, right. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, max out, yes. Antonio, this is for you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So it's the max out. Let's assume that you have like uh, two outputs that are being given by like uh, you have a network, right? That's making two predictions simultaneously. So you see that I have like two sets of weights. Okay. So I want the, the maximum out of those two. So that's an activation function that you could use because now you have like two outputs being given to you. And you're just going to pick whatever is the maximum one. So that's just like an option. Like if there is any application that would actually benefit from that, that's usually something that it's, it's a spin off of the problem that you're working with, right? 
But for most of what we're going to be doing, we're just going to be dealing with like a single output because it's a regression that we're going to be working with, right? Okay. So I think we are in the point of finally looking at some code, but let's just stop with this fury madness. <laughs> let's go back to look at some code. Okay, so uh, Pepe, did you show them where to get the, the code? Yeah, once again, if you go to the SE data in the virtual machine. I'm gonna let you share your screen so you yeah. can. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm gonna go get some water in the meantime. Yeah. So if you go, this is a virtual machine. If you go like usual, you do um you enter in the C data, you do the git pool. Okay. Then you do the async. Okay. And then you migrate inside to the media CD exercise. Okay. And then over here, you, you do source, source activate. And then you open the Jupyter Lab, and you have the three. Here you have all the three height, okay. And in particular, number four is this one that Anton is going to cover. So, in the meantime, that is coming back. You can follow all this step and make it bigger. Yeah, okay. I just think that's already one thirty, right? Okay, whatever you can arrive, you Tony, it's fine. Um, and then maybe I, I start like if the yeah start yeah of course yeah, yeah. Uh, stop it. So and then uh, probably you need to if try to run this one. If it doesn't work, you need to install Deep Torch. I'm not sure because I, I think you need to install, but try to run this if you get an error. Then you pip install it, so you open the terminal and you do pip3 install and you install torch because I think I installed it a few days ago, but but they didn't have it. Uh, isn't that the same virtual machine that we used for Matera last time? He, yes, but it's a new version, I mean, because we were using the 13. Okay, so I give the floor to you. Uh. Oh, yeah, okay. I just assumed that was still the same virtual machine. But if it's not, you just need to do the pip install as Pepe suggested there. Yeah. So you can go and share it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. So I, I'm just going to start this with you guys. Uh, and then we see how far we get. Because I also don't want to get too deep into the code and then stop in the middle. But in any case, actually, Pep, I think I will stop here. Otherwise, we're going to stop in the middle of the code. I'm going to have to go over the code again. I think it's just better. And then we take this few minutes to answer more questions, perhaps. And then we start fresh on the code next lecture. Yeah, fine. Also, like this, we can we can open some discussion and see. Yeah, I think um, it's might be a better use of the time because I'm sure you guys have questions. So now might be a good time to, to ask them. Well, maybe you can also point the code this time to implementing and see how using PyTorch and Ski and Ski learn with this perception and try to make an estimation. So we will see the different tuning parameter Link what, it back sorry? with it. Skill learn for what? No, we were going to use torch and skill learn or not. Only PyTorch, uh, torch, yeah. No, it's just PyTorch. Skill learn yeah, is just like for the metrics. You see? That's oh, like, okay, just skill learn. Yeah. yeah, just PyTorch for PyTorch to design the neural networks. That's for what design the, the neural network. Yeah. So the different tuning parameter that we are going to set for PyTorch, they are going to be strictly linked with the formula that we see before. I mean, we, that you explained during the class. Yeah. During yeah. The theory. 
Mm -hmm. So that, that's why they were they were important to understand the weight, what they are, the minimum loss function, and so on. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, as I, I try to uh, tell you guys with the car analogy, right? What I'm telling you here, it's exactly how things work. Because yeah. if you don't care about how things work, in, in the end of the day, you have so many packages out there for Python that are meant for people who just want to get results and like with minimal effort, right? It's like, okay, I have data and I have like some prediction that I'm trying to estimate. Like if you go to SQLearn, you have so many things available to you directly, right? You have like random forest, you have support vector machine, support vector regression, logistic regression, and so on, you know? But in the end of the day, when things don't work properly, you have two options. Either you bang your head against the desk until you find a set of parameters that are gonna help you to solve the problem, or you understand what these parameters are for, what they do, so you can specifically go after the things that might help you to uh, find a solution. For example, supported vector regression had the regularization parameter C, which basically says how much weight you want to give to these uh, weights that you're finding, right? Like how much regularization you want to impose on those, right? And what are the margins that you're willing to allow your model like with respect to errors and the tolerance and so on. So like you only have three parameters there. But now let's think of like other uh, like regression techniques that would have more parameters. So for example, I think SQLearn also implements neuronal networks, but you have like how many perceptors you want to use, activation functions that you want to use, if you want to include bias or not. So you see that the number of possibilities, things for you to try, there are just so many. You spend like a week just like making small variations in parameters, right? So like, it's important for you to understand what each one of those parameters are actually doing. So like, if the activation function is wrong, the one that you're trying to use, right? You're mapping your data to a completely different range. That's not the range from your actual uh, expected outputs, right? There is no way how you're gonna find a neuronal network that's actually gonna fit your data, right? So like, it's one parameter that's just like gonna trash all the analysis that you're doing, you see? So like, I, I hope that's the, the importance that you uh, can appreciate here. It's like, why is it important for you to understand each one of these components? I know that you guys want to solve problems, but like, it's important for you to understand which problems those parameters are solving, okay? Yes, In, to make an analogy of what Antonio will say, we, we see with the random forest the other day that um, I think, uh, yeah, Antonio, you were not there, but for example, in SQLearn in Random Forest, um, the default parameter are very, very, very prone to overfitting. Okay, so um, you really need to understand it. This there are not many; there are three or four, uh, but you really need to understand it in order to to get some. Um, some prediction that is not in overfitting. And I saw how to play with this parameter in order to not go in the overfitting situation. Rather, for example, the random forest inside R, he has default parameter that most of the time they are fine. And even if you improve tuning a bit, you are going to gain two, 3% of the accuracy. Rather in, in the skill learn, you need to really tuning from, from a scratch. So, and I think now we will see next next week that in, in neural network in PyTorch is even more, uh, yes, like you say, more time consuming if you don't understand what to tuning in particular. So um, yeah, that's why they are important, this, this aspect. It's not poor from, it's, it's not only for understanding the math, but in order to become making applicable in the real life. Any one of you was try already to use a neural network for some analysis that he, and he was already dealing with a lot of this parameterization and he didn't know how to perform it and so on. Maybe Sebastian, you have tried something or? No. No, okay. Good. It's gonna be new for everyone. Yeah, good. Also. 
so for for example also for me i mean i heard the, the antonio lecture several times but i never play with it okay so this is important that we, we do it also from my side are you telling me that you don't do the exercise or propose <laughs> i will <laughs> now i will <laughs> now i will so um uh, so in order to now I, I have also a study case that I really care like that we hide so with that one I think I will I will play a good part in, uh, in making the different estimation and so on. Okay, every any one of you is trying to to think how to use these, let's say not only neural network but this machine learning technique for regression or even classification issues even if we are not covering, but the concepts are very similar. And maybe they want to spend a few few minutes to say, I'm thinking to do this kind of regression and so on. Because I know- I'm actually research, doing okay. uh, optimization for my research. I'm uh, estimating the reflectance of uh, surfaces on, on, on Mars actually. And I try to remove the uh, the shading of inclined surfaces. So when you, they are inclined uh, away from the sun, I want to estimate uh, the real surface as if the sun would uh, illuminate it from another angle. So, and I'm using reflectance models for that and um, multiple imagery um, from different angles, observed from different angles. So these are my input parameters. And um, then I try to, to model the, anisotropy of the surface. But cool. the, the, what are you using? For, for that? What are you using to model that? Just simply? Uh, uh, LM, LM fit, Levenberg, Marquardt. Oh, okay. Nice. Okay, so you, you want to try to apply one of these techniques also for... Uh, actually, for I would love to do... Uh, much more complicated things, but I think this would be an application for this. Yeah. Okay, cool. Looking forward to see the your work. And so yes, yes, in this line, already start to think about you know something to present uh, for the final. I'm repeating and repeating the final um, week in Madeira or online if you're not coming, because that one will be also compulsory in order to have the diploma and everything. Um, so again, if you don't have any clue, you can even get the tree height, you know, and preparing all other variables and, uh, you know, and try other techniques, tuning better the parameters. So don't get lost if you don't have any idea. Just get the tree height, use the same data set, build up other predictors that you think are important from an ecological aspect or whatever you think and start to play. It's important that you use the tools. Eh? Yeah, the, uh, this is actually a fascinating idea that I can that just uh, throw in a lot of data into this, into some model. And I don't take, I need to take care about the reflectance behavior of the surface. I just, um, for example, I have one image which is uh, illuminated from the side and the other one is illuminated from the top. And if I have enough, samples of that so the model can predict how the surface looks from above even if there is no real physical assumptions of it mm -hmm. mm, yes i think if i can follow i think so it's important that you have always some some parameter that you can consider as a ground through as the real yeah, I have some yeah, images okay. which are recorded from, from the top, but for other areas. So not for the one I, at the end, I want to, uh, yeah, at the, at the end, I want to apply this method then on areas where I don't have this information, but I want to estimate it. In a okay, you, 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 you can try. Of course, where you don't have an estimation, the, 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 the question I mean, comes, okay, how you know that is going to be yeah. good? How do you validate that, right? Yeah. Yeah. How you validate yeah. it? Because it can work for your study area. And then, you know, is like in the spatial science, if you have a point in, in Germany and you build up your, uh, your model in Germany, and then you try to apply in Asia, it's, maybe it's tuned just for, so it's, it's very tuned for Germany and not for Asia. 
then even Asia that are perfect the same condition, then it's going to work. Okay. Yeah, but if I have if I have in my in my training data set, I have all the possible conditions in it, uh, even if it's not in Asia, but let's say in Egypt, then uh, it should fit as well. Perfect. So if your predictors are really able to cover up predictor and response to cover up all the data distribution and data behavior, so is where the model will work in that case, you know. Um, but try to think, okay, that one is just a science, let's say a science validation procedure that you need to think if it makes sense or not. But again, even if you, anyone is trying to do something that is not strong from a science perspective, doesn't matter for us. It's important that you understand right. how to implementing, you are implementing the code and then it's going to be from your side to have the knowledge to apply the science of your field of, of the application, okay? So it's important that you do correctly the, the thinking, so the geocomputation thinking and procedure, and then the modeling procedure and uh, and the science you are going to to, to insert from, from your field, yes, from your knowledge and field. So just very okay. quickly, I'm going to have to sign out. Uh... Okay. I I know it's a lot to absorb, so please try to digest that. Uh, if you have questions, of course, feel free to drop questions like via Slack. Uh, and I can now is like if you send me questions, I can try to incorporate those questions in the beginning of the next lecture because if you have questions, most yeah. likely other people have questions as well. So yeah, please ask questions. Stop me like and we try to address those you know uh, we are really but i think we're getting somewhere like i feel like we did some progress do we send the question to you via email or in the slack it's like slack. it's more yeah it's more accessible like, so we don't expect an answer in the slack we, you will address it in the next uh, lecture uh unless it's something very punctual which okay. is like something yeah. that i can answer in like one sentence I answer via is like, otherwise I will get a more elaborate answer via uh, beginning of the next lecture. Yeah. Okay, thank you, so Antonio. We start the next lecture already in the code. So the next Perfect. lecture. Uh, so be sure, yeah. Be sure, be that sure you... to have the code. Yeah. Ready. Okay, thanks, Antonio. Cool, okay, see you guys. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. Thank Antonio. you, bye. Okay, and uh, for the for you guys, uh, the lecture is over. I don't know if you have anything to ask um, or some other point.